Okay, so one of the topics that I get so many questions about is whole body vibration. I had a video posted on this in the past, which left us open to more questions probably than answers. And so I've been fielding questions for the last several months. I am so happy today to have Dr. Clinton Rubin in an interview so we can actually dig into some of these questions and learn a little bit more about the technology, the research, and help us to understand where whole body vibration can fit into a comprehensive program for both bone health, but also health span. So, uh, Dr. Rubin, Clinton, I'm really excited about this. Like I said, so many questions on this, but to get us started, since not everybody will have listened to you on um, an interview in the past, can you just give us a little background of kind of your current position and how you got to where you are through the lens of vibration? Uh, sure, I'd, I'd love to. And thanks so much for the invite to join you and, and your audience. I hope uh, I can tackle some of the questions you throw at me. I'm Clinton Rubin. I'm a distinguished professor of biomedical engineering at uh, Stony Brook University at, out in New York. I'm also director of the Center for Biotechnology here. Um, I've been working in the area of how bone perceives and responds to mechanical signals for all of my scientific life, which is longer than I care to admit, for, but certainly for the past 40 years. And I've approached it really as a basic scientist. I'm very interested in how cells in our body can actually sense challenges that are put before them and how the cells themselves might adapt to these challenges. But then um, in my work as a uh, doing translational science, I'm very interested in taking the basic science and translating it to the clinic. And what we found with the cell, bone cell uh, sensitivity to mechanical signals that there's an opportunity to harness this sensitivity and use it as a non-drug approach to prevent or maybe even reverse osteoporosis. Oh, that's that's fantastic, and I love the you know the approach there because I look at osteoporosis as a kind of a global problem in the body, and thinking about it from the cellular perspective is is another way to look at that to say it's not just a bone fragility problem or a calcium deficiency; it is a global problem that starts at the cell. Something that I I'm really interested in in your approach to how this can impact osteoporosis is is the whole body vibration devices themselves. Can you give us a little background on the the technology as you've seen it function through your career and change in where it is now with what is actually being provided um, through Meridine, if I'm saying that right? Uh, great, uh, sure. Let me see if I can put it in the context of me as a scientist. Uh, rather than a uh, person who's interested necessarily in whole body vibration, rather the path to how I got to vibration. And this goes back to, to sort of my own self-intro about why I'm interested in mechanical signals in bone. And this, you know, it sort of ranges from every, everywhere from why NASA and astronauts are really terrified of a microgravity environment or long trips to, to Mars, it's the absence of gravity and without these functional challenges, without this stress and strain on the bone, the bone resorbs away and becomes at risk of fracture, which is terrifying enough if you slip on an icy sidewalk in New York and you happen to break your uh, distal radius or your hip. But imagine if you step onto the gravitational pull of Mars nine months away from Earth and because your bone is resorbed away from microgravity or the absence of gravity for so many months that you break your hip, there's not exactly an emergency room next door you can go to. On, on the other hand, though, you think of professional tennis players as perhaps the best example I can think of, particularly as you put forward uh, the picture of bone loss or osteoporosis being a systemic challenge then you think of the professional tennis player. And professional tennis players have about 30 to 35% more bone in their playing arm than the arm that simply throws the ball into the air. And, and that to me is not only a fascinating biologic adaptation, but it's a demonstration 
that there's local adaptation to mechanical challenges. So how did I get to vibration? It started by looking at the Venus Williams of the world and how they have so much more bone in their playing arm. And to think about what it is about those mechanical challenges that drives a response. Or if I'm an astronaut and I'm flying in space, what's missing and allows bone to resorb? And so over the past decades, and I'm admitting my age, over the past decades, We've looked at things like amplitude or magnitude of the signal, cycle number, how many times per day, the frequency, both in terms of how many bouts per day, but actually the rate at which you apply the signal. And what we found is that there's a real trade-off. You can protect your bone by very few, very large events, like get up on your desk and jump off 30 times a day, would probably protect your skeleton unless you broke your skeleton in doing your, your therapy. Right. But the trade-off is that if you do very, very, very small signals, but many, many, many times, you could actually protect your skeleton as well. The problem is if you do those small signals one time per second, one cycle per second, one hertz, there's not enough time in the day to get that number of signals into your skeleton. So what we did is we compressed them into frequency. So rather than one cycle per day, or one cycle per second, sorry, 10, 20, 30 cycles per second, we increased the frequency. What we found is bone cells, not only could you get them to respond, their sensitivity increased. And so that's getting close to the clues of vibration. The, the signals don't need to be large so long as they're quick and you can compress them in time. But the challenge then as a basic scientist, what possible physiologic relevance could such a high frequency signal have? I mean, Usain Bolt is not running a 100 meter dash at 30 cycles per second. Right. But it turns out that your muscles and you being an orthopedic surgeon know this, that your muscles are actually pretty much an inefficient motor. So when you pick up a beer or you pick up a, a cup of coffee, you may be raising it very slowly, but your muscles are actually vibrating. They vibrate between 20 to 50 cycles per second. And that gave us the physiologic link between why bone cells might be sensitive to higher frequency domains and gave us sort of the exercise mimetic or the opportunity to put in really small signals to turn on the bone cells without exercise. Yeah. And I think that's what's really interesting. And, I, and I've heard you describe this before, you know, as an exercise mimetic or um, really mimicking exercise to the frame, you know, showing the skeleton that this is that you're you're actually exercising more than you are and you're generating bone as a result of that, which is what I want to dig into next. When you did the research on this, and I, I know you've you've published and co-authored several studies. What is the the biggest impact that you've seen from the the metrics which most people care about? Not necessarily what I care about, but most people talk about bone marrow density. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in, in BMD and studies that you've done or been a part of? Right. So, so you, you're opening up a real Pandora's box here. It depends on how much time your your podcast actually has. But uh, again, it, it's difficult for me to sort of tease apart the clinical outcomes or clinical endpoints, bone mineral density, both bone quantity, how much bone you have, right. and bone quality, right? That that your trabeculae, sort of those little struts of bone at the towards the ends of your long bones, that you could retain bone density, but lose the connectivity, so the quality diminishes. So at the end of the day, what you as, as a clinician are after, or me as a scientist is after, is how can you control bone quantity and quality to protect the musculoskeletal system? So in essence, and, and uh, you know, I don't want to make this a, a punching bag, mm -hmm. but it's not so much for people who are peri or postmenopausal or uh, men, as we age, you know, we get above the age of 35, everyone's losing bone, 2 to 3% per decade. 
So it's both a male and a female problem. It's true that women lose bone very quickly following menopause for three, three to eight years. But the, the opportunity is for us to just make sure that we maintain the bone that we have. So how is it that we can eat right, exercise, have good genes, how this aggregate mm -hmm. actually enables us to avoid the risk of bone fracture? So the clinical trials that, that we have seen have been, to me, the gold standard in treating osteoporosis has been one of where our clinical studies show that our clinical cohorts in the active arms of trials maintain bone, whereas the control groups continue to lose bone. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we may be an anabolic or a bone-producing signal but to me, just as importantly, is we're an anti-resorptive or an anti-catabolic signal. And you could think of that back to this, our premise of this being a exercise mimetic, that at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're telling the bone cells to stick around. We're suppressing the recruitment and activity of osteoclasts, the bone-eating cells. And in reality, I would challenge your audience so rather than think of exercise as being something that stimulates bone formation, which it certainly does, but actually its primary role is to inhibit bone loss. So think not of, well, you know, I want to grow up and be a couch potato. Well, I'm losing bone. I should get up and exercise. In reality, what it is is that exercise is part of the normal formula of retaining many physiologic systems, cardiovascular health, cognition, musculoskeletal health, bone quantity and quality. Think of it, if you take that away and you just binge Netflix uh, TV shows and never get up, what you're doing is you're removing a key regular, regulatory signal. And so what we're trying to do, and, and I'm not silly enough to say that we have found the magic bullet for exercise. But if you are unable or unable to get up and exercise, to go out and run, uh, play tennis against Venus Williams, that doing something mechanical for your skeleton and for the stem cells that create your skeleton is absolutely critical to your musculoskeletal health. So you're right. You got to eat right. You got to have good genes, but you got to get out and if you cannot exercise, then you need to figure out a way to mechanically challenge your skeleton. Yeah, that's fantastic. And and one of the questions I get is, and this comes with uh, you know the osteo strong uh, osteogenic loading conversation as well, which is for people that are doing osteo strong, many of them are not also doing resistance training, which I think is an error because it's not just about bone; it's about balance, it's about stability, it's about other things. So then, in the perspective of, of a vibration plate, if you're doing that, stimulating your bone because you you have an incapacity to play tennis with Venus Williams, should they also be doing resistance training in addition to that? Is there, are you going to overload too much? Are you going to mess with the signal at all? Can you do both? Should you do both? Well, let me let me see if I'm, I can give you a long-winded answer to a very straightforward question. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you two pieces of this. So, so we're talking about vibration of bone, and I've spent many decades studying it, and I'm very proud of the, the body of work that we've produced. But it turns out I spend half my time speaking to, to colleagues like you, talking about the benefits of vibration. And the other half of my time, I talk about the consequences and the risks of vibration. And so the vibration that I study and goes back to these really, really small surrogates for the signals your muscles are producing, these are exceedingly small, barely perceptible, that we, use, we describe our signals as being low-intensity vibration, LIV. And that's something that's below 1G. So if Earth's gravitational field is 1G of, of pole, or 9.8 meters per second squared, and things that are above 1G, right, some of these devices out there, which you know, Galileo, power plates, some of the things you get on Amazon or buy at Costco, 
are generating 5, 10, 15, even 20 G of acceleration. These are things that are exceedingly dangerous. And there are many studies, you know, well beyond our own lab that say, particularly if you have a weak musculoskeletal system, you know, the injured, uh, the, the people that are sick, the people that are recovering from illness, this is perhaps one of the worst things you can do is to stand on one of these Home Depot paint shakers and put your skeleton at risk. So let's be clear that when you and I are talking about the benefits of vibration, you also have to consider that there is too much of a good thing. You're asking the question about resistance exercise. Mm -hmm. And I would say, absolutely, I agree with you. There is it's a, a touch of a Goldilocks paradigm. There could be too much of a good thing. You don't want to overdo it and find yourself with a stress fracture or a muscle injury or a strain. Back to you know your orthopedic clinic, the patients you see uh, in your clinic that overdo it. But there is a real sweet spot, and that you don't necessarily need to return serve with Venus Williams. But it is a good idea if you can, rather than walk ten miles to the to the grocery store to run around the block. You know, so so there is a sort of a give and take. So resistance exercise, absolutely. And I also point out um, that our work and others have shown that the cells that are picking up your resistant exercise, that not only are you building up your bone mass, and you can see that visibly, it's harder to visibly see building up bone mass, but sure. you can build up muscle mass and look really buff at the beach. But your cells themselves are adapting. So mm. your cells actually have a little cytoskeleton as well. It's not quite like a skeleton as you and I might think about it in first go. It has a cytoskeleton that has a transient adaptation to mechanical signals. So if you go to the gym and you exercise, your cells are perceiving the signal. They're adapting their cytoskeleton. So ironically, they can are better placed to adapt to signals downstream. So my suggestion to those that might be listening would be that rather than go to the gym and work for three hours and then go home and watch Netflix, is to go to the gym for 30 minutes, do your resistance exercise, which is attuning your musculoskeletal system and stem cells to be more receptive to mechanical signals, allow the cells to adapt, and three and four year, uh, uh, hours later, go out and challenge them again by walking around the block. So ratchet up the sensitivity of your skeleton. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great explanation. And that actually leads me to my next question, which is people will ask me, what is the best combination if you're going to use, let's just eliminate other variables at this point, and just say, if you're just going to use the vibration plate, I think the manufacturer recommendations is 10 minutes a day. Is that right? Right. So, so it, it's a, you're pinning me a little into a corner. Let me explain <laughs> what I mean. So the when I work with cells or I work with mice or other uh, preclinical models, it's great because my cells show up to work every day and they listen to me perfectly and they're perfectly compliant. But once you get into the clinical world and you're recruiting volunteers to participate in tests, they're not perfectly compliant. So somehow we have to design our trials to maximize compliance. And that means, so to, to me, going back to this issue of your cell adaptations are transient, and if you don't stimulate them every day, the cells themselves become couch potatoes. And then you have to work them back up again. So every day it's essential to do something. The exercise, you mentioned osteostrong. I'm not here to beat them up or anything, but going to a gym once or twice a week isn't the way to build up your bone. It's challenging it briefly every day for at least once per day. And I think of it as being more like a light switch than I do as an accumulated response. Yeah. And so if it, your cell system 
is such that once you get to the point that you turn it on, additional information doesn't make the light turn on brighter. It just keeps it on. So what we found, and you could come back to this 10 minutes, we found that people interrupting their day to stand on this bathroom scale kind of thing and talk on the phone or read a book or watch TV while standing on this device, for about 10 minutes, people don't find it to be, let's say, an annoyance. Yeah. But if you said, I want you to stand on this for 30 minutes a day, three times a day, people are going to slide it under their bed and never see it again. So if you're asking me what the best way for our trials and the way we prescribe them now everywhere for rehabilitation from cancer treatments, for neuropathies, for uh, childhood genetic disorders, for peri- and postmenopausal osteoporosis, the best prescription I would give would be, again, back to the principle of how do you turn on that light and how do you keep your compliance up is that you get the cell adaptations very quickly between five to 10 minutes per day with that first light switch. And then you allow those cells to basically bake the refractory period, the rest period. Then between three to six hours later, do another five to 10 minute bout. And what we find is that is not long enough period that people get upset or, or slide it under the bed, and they become engaged and it becomes part of their routine. So even if you wanted to only do it once per day and you committed to going to the gym for that second bout later in the day, I'm totally down for that. No, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Sorry to interrupt this interview, but I just wanted to take a quick moment to ask you to do me a favor. If you will just click that subscribe button and sign up for notifications if you want, the subscribe button helps YouTube to put this in front of other people that are looking for answers to their bone health questions. So help me help them by clicking that subscribe button. Also, if you haven't read our book yet, the Osteoporosis Breakthrough is available for free download. You can download the PDF uh, in uh, the description below. In that same description, you'll also find a link for our masterclass. If you haven't taken that, this is where I combine all this information into one place and answer questions. Totally free. All those links are in the description below. One of the questions I get to, and this goes to, I'd love to get your, your explanation of how this works, but the load, particularly with the Meridine device, because it's not, you know, it's, it's not the power plate. It's not, you know, throwing you around the room. People will feel like the load dissipates as it goes throughout the body. And one of the questions that I, that I have in our patient population is when we see people that respond really well, particularly in their hips, and let's say they have, you know, scoliosis or back pain or whatever, and they, they can't load their upper body. They can't do overhead press. They're not, they're not carrying heavy load through their arms or on their back. Um, is there a way, I guess, first, first part of this question is, is does it have significant impact on the spine, especially with knees, you know, straight ish and standing on the plate? And is there a way to increase that load on the spine, potentially like sitting on the plate or something like that? So, so let me answer this by reminding you that back in, in your operating theater days, that you're doing a total joint on someone or you're doing spine surgery, what you're doing, the predominant activity of your day is standing around. We're not out practicing for four hours a day on the tennis courts or running marathons every day. And isn't it curious that marathon runners don't have monstrously huge skeletons? It goes back to this turning the light on. And that once the skeleton adapts to whatever the signal is, enough is enough, and that's fine. So what you're asking about, or what I, as a, as a bioengineer, would describe your question as, as pointing to, is something called the transmissibility function. So, you know, while you're walking down a sidewalk, in my case in, in New York, and a truck passes by, you can feel the shaking of the sidewalk through the bottoms of your feet, the plantar surfaces of your feet, and you can feel it sort of rise up. So you almost can feel your teeth chatter a little bit. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily a treatment for osteoporosis, <laughs> but what happens is that your musculoskeletal system, the weight-bearing system, is a viscoelastic system that actually is quite stiff at higher frequencies. 
so around 25, 30 hertz cycles per second, your musculoskeletal system is actually very, very, very stiff. It's like, think of a puddle of water, and if you gently place your hand in it, the water just dissipates away and your hand floats to the bottom. But if you slap the water, the water displaces very quickly, but the water feels very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Sort of the viscoelastic nature of fluid-filled systems like your bone and muscle. So the Meridine device, which is oscillating at 30 cycles per second, and it's accelerating up and down for a peak-to-peak -peak acceleration of 0.4 Gs, or basically 30% of Earth's gravitational field, what we found is the transmissibility function, the amount of information from the bottoms of your feet in a relaxed, erect stance that transmits to your hip is around 75%, so 0.4 G at the base of your foot to around 0.3 G at your hip, and around the same amount to the lumbar areas of your spine. Okay. And what happens is if you go and you bend your knees while you're standing on the device, what you notice is a very small tremor or chatter in your teeth, barely perceptible, but when somebody call, how do I know my device is working? I tell them to put their teeth together while they're standing on the device, and then you can feel a clatter, just the slightest little bit. You bend your knees, the transmission is lost. Ironically, this is exactly the reason why people who talk about power plate tell you to bend your knees. That's because you don't want 10G transmitting to your head, causing basically repetitive accelerations and decelerations of your brain against your brain case. And I'm dead serious about this, that the risk of vibration causing percussive injuries to the brain, think of boxer's dementia, think of hitting a soccer ball with your head, is very, very real. So if you are silly enough to stand on a power plate, make very, very sure that you bend your knees because you don't want the acceleration transmitted to your brain. But if you remember your high school physics, the one constant of Newton's law is you can't just get rid of energy. It's there. So if you're standing on a power plate that's accelerating, decelerating you at 10 G and you want to make sure that 10 G doesn't reach your head because you don't want your head to lift off your shoulders and end up over at the other side of the room, you bend your knees, that acceleration, that energy has to go somewhere. And that's 10 G of mechanical information that's being delivered to the articular surfaces of your knee. You might as well take a pencil eraser, call up your favorite orthopedic surgeon and says, I'm standing on a power plate, when can you fit me in for total knee? So back to my original statement, half my life I think of vibrations being very good as it's taking the good out of exercise and putting something in to the perception and sensing that cells have for mechanical signals in doing the Goldilocks bit where, oh, this is good, I'm going to adapt, to exactly what the orthopedic community is worried about, which is overuse syndrome. And this is going to risks of neurologic disease, cognition disease, brain injury, the whole bit. So be very, very careful. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. For, this, for the spine part, um, I, so people ask me this all the time, which is why I went, I'm going to sort of restate the same question, which is, what happens if somebody sits on the plate? Okay. <laughs> you would not be the first person to ask me this. Um, and you raised up, up the issue of idiopathic scoliosis before. And mm -hmm. that's, you can imagine, the rather than have a straight spine to send the transmission up the spine, that with curvature, you could argue that there's loss of transmissibility. So I'm going to pull out a yellow flag or a surrender flag here. And I'm going to say that clinical trials have been so difficult to run and so expensive to run mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Then we ask very straightforward, simple questions about them. You stand on a device, and we know what the transmissibility function is. We can monitor using DEXA or, or CT scans, a T-score or a bone density score or a bone quality score. We can see a response. To ask a question about sitting on a device, shouldn't it work too? I would agree with the people who are asking your questions. It sounds like it should. And the reason that I have changed from where I was 15, 20 years ago is 15 or 20 years ago, I was right with you in the orthopedic community thinking about something you're familiar with, Wolf's Law, form and function in bone. Yeah. And you, the reason Venus Williams has so much more bone in her playing arm is because of the stress and the forces that she's placing on it is causing the bone to see the signal adapt, and grow. But what we've changed to now, and you know, our, our science is pointing us to, is it's not so much force and strain, which is really where I made whatever mark I have in the orthopedic world is on setting stress and strain in bone. I am now completely convinced that it's acceleration and deceleration. Then not just of bone cells, the cells are lying within your bone cortex and on the surface, the osteoblasts and the osteocytes, but also the cells that are the progenitors to bone cells. They're called mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, that live in your bone marrow. We think that mechanical signals are telling these MSCs to grow up, to differentiate into bone cells, because if they do not, they default into fat cells. So these stem cells are pluripotent. They can become lots of different things. But in a very simple way, you could think of them hanging, hanging out in your bone marrow, either becoming bone cells, which is good for growing bone, or they become fat cells, which is bad for the beach, but it's also bad for all your major organ system because they yeah. start to sort of grow on to your heart, your liver, your kidney, you know, causes inflammation, uh, cytokine inflammation, the whole nine yards. So just from an orthopedic perspective, and, and I haven't abandoned the, the spine question yet, but think of the trabeculae in your vertebrae or in your femoral neck, and think of osteoporosis as most people think of it as being the resorption of these trabeculae, leaving voids in that space, diminishing the quality of bone. That bridge structure isn't there anymore. You wouldn't want to drive across the Brooklyn Bridge if you knew that half the struts were no longer there. It's weak. But rather than thinking of it as bone struts, thinking of it as being displaced and those voids filling with fat. Where did that fat come from? Your bone marrow as we age becomes fattier and fatter, fattier. You know this better than I from your surgical experience that the aged community has fewer stem cells because your bone marrow has changed from this blood engorged bone marrow with lots of stem cells to this fatty, if not gray and dying tissue. Yeah. So what we're trying to do with the mechanical signals is to take whatever stem cells there are and convince them to become bone cells rather than fat cells. So to the spine and sitting on the device, you, you thought I forgot that back to that question, I used to think that you needed to stand on the device to get that Brooklyn Bridge truck going over the bridge to load the piers to get the piers not to resorb away. But now what I think, it's the truck driving over the bridge that causing the bridge to vibrate and the cells in the piers are saying, oh, I'm vibrating, I'm still being used, I better grow bone. So yes, I think it's possible that simply the oscillation of up and down, the acceleration, acceleration. of the cells yeah. is enough to turn, turn it off. So I don't know this, gotcha. but I believe it to be the answer to be yes. Gotcha. 
Yeah. And, and people will say, they'll tell me, they'll say, Hey, I do, I want to work on my wrist. So I do, I do push ups on the plate or, you know, I love my spine this way. Or, and people are probably standing on their head. I don't know. I'm not recommending that. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't <laughs> so, put your head on the plate. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just, I think it's really interesting, but you actually brought up, um, well, one thing I, I want to comment on, I love that you comment on the, the MSC differentiation in osteoblasts versus, uh, adipocytes. And um, something that the audience probably doesn't know, which I think is is also really important, is that osteoclasts come from MSCs that also differentiate into macrophages, which is part of your immune system. And so this is a, a really interesting um, conversation that gets into the drug thing we won't talk about. But when the drugs prevent osteoclasts from being produced, they're actually suppressing macrophages as well. And so we have to look at bone health, the musculoskeletal system in context with the rest of the systems because they are all interconnected. You mentioned uh, you mentioned the knees and I, I want to talk about articular cartilage because some of the feedback I get on the YouTube channel and the comments is that people are concerned about their articular cartilage and with so many different you know models and brands and, and technology of plates, you mentioned that you're concerned about the articular cartilage with with a higher higher frequency or amplitude rather. Yep. Uh, do you think that in this circumstance, is there a benefit to articular cartilage? Is it going to aggravate arthritis? Do you think it's going to make it better? What, what's your experience on that? So, so um, of course, we've, we've thought about this. And, you know, when, when we were doing early uh, preclinical trials with the device, and we were trying to uh, get clearance both with internal review boards in hospitals, as well as the clearance with the FDA, we needed to demonstrate that, you know, first do no harm. And so in some of our long-term animal studies, uh, we look specifically at the cell makeup of the articular cartilage of the knees. And what we found is a, no, no evidence of damage, most importantly, which was comforting, but that we found some hypertrophy to the cartilage that it actually looked uh, more viable. We've published on this. Um, if, if you or uh, some of your listeners have um, access to PubMed, which is you know a, a good repository of medical literature, you can basically see some of the studies we've done with cartilage. And so at the levels that we study, so remember that as you walk down the street, your acceleration deceleration is around 1.2 G right? You, you're accelerating forward and then decelerating when your heel hits the ground, right? And if you're running, maybe you're around 2G, twice Earth's gravitational field. You're lifting into the air, so you have to accelerate more than Earth's gravitational pull. And then you come and you slam back into the ground, let's say around 2G. We're at 0.4G, right? So I get questions all the time. Is this going to shake my corneas loose? Is this going to uh, loosen my fillings, etc.? All of our inclusion and exclusion criteria that we have to go through with our hospital IRBs in clinical trials around the world, we remind the IRBs that the signal we're delivering is basically 30% of what you do as you walk down the street. We're just doing it at a higher frequency. So it's not a jarring motion at all. So in, in that sense, it, it is safe. But remember that cartilage is also coming from MSCs, right? Um, so the whole point is to avoid the adipocytes, avoid adipogenesis, and to promote. And remember, muscle too, they come from satellite cells, but mm -hmm. sort of a version of MSCs, right? That sarcopenia, which we haven't talked about, and osteopenia, that's basically bone wasting as a function of age, osteopenia, sarcopenia, muscle wasting as a function of age, that exercise is perhaps the one best prescription you can come up to slow that process down and protect the musculoskeletal system. But we've shown with chondrogenesis and cartilage, osteoblastogenesis and bone formation, and satellite cells, myogenesis and muscle hypertrophy, that these really small mechanical signals can actually be beneficial to the, the entire system. And we haven't even talked about the neuromuscular system mm. and how well 
the, the muscle perceives these signals. So I'm not yeah. saying we found a magic bullet, and I apologize if I saw it sound this way. I'm excited by it. Sure. But I will say to your listeners that if you aren't exercising, get out and exercise. If you are lying on the couch listening to this podcast, sit up and listen to it. <laughs> if you're sitting listening to it, stand up. And if you're standing up, go walk around the block with some headphones on and listen to it because mechanical signals is how evolution has told cells that you're still viable. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. Uh, before we move on from the, the risk part, I did want to, you mentioned retinal detachment. I guess you mentioned the retina. So people ask me about retinal detachment. People ask me about scoliosis. They ask me about joint replacement. Can you just speak to any of those things? And sure. I always say, ask your surgeon, talk to your- uh, Absolutely, you know, absolutely. But, but in general. For, for Again, I'm going to remind people that a problem with the vibration world is that it, vibration is pool. It's one big pool. Right? Your doctor, your cardiologist may say, take a baby aspirin per day to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. That doesn't mean you go home and take 40 aspirin because it's going to work that much better. right? So when you think of vibration, tease apart and ask whoever device you're asking about, ask for the scientific basis of why they're using the device. So you ask about corneal displacements or detachments even. Think of Sugar Ray Leonard actually having his cornea detached by a punch in the eye. That there is published literature out there that says that people with detached retinas from standing on vibration devices. It's very real. It's very real when we think of spine and low back pain. Perhaps the biggest pathogen to low back pain are long-term truck drivers and helicopter pilots exposed to long-term vibration. And you know, in Morgantown, West Virginia, there's an entire NIOSH facility, a national facility that studies nothing but vibration in the workplace. And I will point out, if you don't believe me, look up something called ISO, standing for International Standards Organization, ISO 2631, which is an international standard for human thresholds for vibration. And it tells you how much vibration you should be exposed to in the workplace if you happen to be using vibrating machinery or in the workplace if you're standing on a vibrating floor or in a train you're a train conductor vibration is a nasty pathogen the vibrations that we use are considered safe for up to four hours per day and as you kindly pointed out we're just looking for 10 minutes per day of, of total exposure at 8g and 10g it isn't considered safe for even 10 seconds per day. So enough with corneal displacements. There's a group in Hong Kong at um, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Chuck, I think, is what is called Chinese Hospital of the University of Hong Kong that actually published a study on young women with idiopathic scoliosis asking the question about spine. And we're able to demonstrate, I think it was a six-month study to show increases in bone density, both quantity and quality of bone in the active group, the young ladies who stood on the device versus the blinded control group. So that's showing that in scoliosis, it's actually positive uh, input. And you're asking another question, which I've now forgotten. There's a third- Total, total joints, which total is joints. Like, you know, my, so, my orthopedic background. I, I have a, a strong- Fair enough. This, but, I, yeah, but tell me I'll your- give you two thought. versions of that. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, using the same premise of 1.2G for walking and that we're at 0.4G, there are hospital review boards from uh, Harvard Medical School to the Sydney Health System, to Sydney Australia Health System, have said that these things are, are safe. In all the clinical trials we've done from kids with Duchenne's, kids with cerebral palsy, kids in cancer remission, 
up to perimenal, postmenopausal, and the frail elderly. We've never had to report a serious adverse event to our data safety monitoring boards. But you being an orthopedic surgeon and asking about joints, the very first study we did with vibration, which was published over 30 years ago, 1992, I think, showed that in a porous implant, which you know what a porous surfaced implant is, a cinder bead implant, uh, maybe your audience doesn't, but it's a way as the orthopedic community has evolved away from cemented implants or using non-cemented implants with the idea of getting the bone to interdigitate, to integrate into the implant to hold it better, right. that the concern is in the orthopedic community, again, you know better than I, is to avoid that fibrous interface, right? You want bone to grow in, not fibrous tissue to grow in, right? You want it nice and bonded. So the very first study we did is we put centered beaded implants in the bone and vibrated it. And we showed that if you didn't load it at all, the couch potato, why the orthopedic surgeon wants you up and around as soon as you can. But if you didn't load the implant, the fibrous interface went in, those macrophages arrived, and bone resorbed away from the implant, worst case scenario. Right. If we loaded at very, very small loads, but at one cycle per second, we got a boundary of bone that started to follow or silhouette the beaded implant. If we loaded it, and back in those days, we loaded things at 20 cycles per second rather than 30 cycles per second, but at extremely small levels of mechanical acceleration at 20 hertz, we got massive integration into the implant. So my argument there, or my perspective there, is that not only is it safe, but it's perhaps beneficial to the bony ingrowth or the osseointegration of the, of the implant. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying that from an extrapolation, we have sure. not done a study on humans, but the animal studies would say that there's a good possibility that it's good for implants and our hospital review boards have not excluded people from participating with total knees or total hips. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. And that's always been my thought too, is that it would likely improve that interface. And I've, I've not seen that study, so I'm glad that that study was done. Um, and as far as cemented implants go, there are different, so my, my subspecialty was actually foot and ankle. So I did a fair number of ankle replacements. Um, and the ankle replacements, at least that I was trained on, all still had to be cemented in um, just because that's what they were FDA approved to do, even though they, they weren't actually designed for that. But another story. Um, so, but what my concern about cement is, are, you know, are we actually create potentially creating this, this wear and tear breaking down the cement, the interface, but I like the way that you say it is that it's a third of what you're getting with walking. And I want my patients to walk as much as they can. So why would I prevent them right. doing that? But you know, better than I, that, that the thing that haunts you is when your patient comes in six months or a year later, you radiograph the implant. And there's that radiolucency, right? That's the evidence of the fibrous interface. Bad news. Bad news. So what you want to be sure is that the bone doesn't recruit these macrophages and doesn't recruit the osteoclast and doesn't cause an inflammatory state, that it stays healthy and viable. Yeah. Right? So I'm 100% with you. Yeah. No, that, that totally makes sense. All right. And then last thing, because I know we, we've gone long, um, not too long. <laughs> uh, I try to keep these short if possible. So the last thing I want to talk about, you mentioned neuromuscular. Um, and just in brief, is the, does the evidence support the idea that using the, the plate is going to improve muscle? Is it development? Is it hypertrophy? Is it strength? Is there a clear measurable outcome that gets better with use of the plate? So uh, our conversation, you and I, that, that we had before uh, your audience joined, which I very much enjoyed, that we're clearly on the same page, that when we think of treatment of osteoporosis, you can't just treat the bone. You have to treat the bone, you have to treat the muscle, you have to make sure that you don't have things in your room that you trip over to the cat, the rug, that sort of thing. But it's also how you perceive your environment. That's not just your eyes and your ears, 
but your Meisner Pacinian corpuscles, all the, the, the pressure sensors in your foot, et cetera. You know, one of the best ways to ensure that you trip is to have a diabetic or a cancer-induced neuropathy, right? Yeah. You start losing your balance, you're less stable, and you have a greater tendency to fall. And so some of the studies that we've done that were funded by NASA, of all things, in long-term bed rest, we studied that people who are confined to long-term bed rest are much less stable when they stand up after being in bed for a long period of time. There's volunteers in bed for 90 days. When they stand up, they're very unstable and they wobble quite a bit. Those subjects where we delivered the vibration to them in the supine, in the lying down position, when they stood up, they had retained and protected their balance. So I'm with you that drugs that, that just treat bone, I'm, they're good. They're FDA approved. You can only use them for a, a certain time period. Some of them are anabolic and some of them are anti-resorptive and some of them try to be all things to all people. But to do this without protecting your muscle, or to do this without protecting your neuromuscular system, I think is probably a formula that's only addressing one leg of the triangle, no pun intended. And so we have actually looked at not only muscle and muscle force and muscle strength, but muscle activity and how quickly it can respond. These are, again, preclinical animal, animal trials but we've shown that mice that are subject to, to the LIV signal actually in both aged populations and young populations have a much faster power to force relationship to tetanus. So they respond much more quickly and they respond much more strongly. So, so this is the idea that if you lay up in bed for 90 days, and stand up to play tennis against Venus Williams, it's not going to turn out too well because you're slow, you're weak, and you're going to fall over. So yes, we have shown that vibration is good for muscle and good for bone, but good for balance. In a study we're doing with a group at a Oregon Health Sciences University, early data, which we just presented a month ago at the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, is showing beneficial outcomes for cancer treatment-induced neuropathy. Mm -hmm. So people that actually are diagnosed with cancer and they start their chemo or their radiation treatments, they, an, an offshoot or a consequence of treatment can be neuropathy, like a diabetic neuropathy. And the cancer treatment has to be pulled back, increasing the risk of the progression of the disease, to save the limb. And we've shown in subject setting of the device, for all the reasons we've talked about, activating the cells, telling them to become bone, not fat, staying active, staying balanced, that the incidence and the power and the uh, uh, get up and go out of chair tests, etc., are better in those on the device than them and than those in the control group. So all those things, cartilage, neuromuscular balance, all good. Yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, all right. I think we should wrap this up for the bone health people. Um, so let me just say thank you for your time and thank you for all the research that you do. I think it's so important that we have people that are so dedicated to, you know, serving the mission and finding the, the truth behind the scientific things that you're investigating. So I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, and I think the audience is really going to enjoy this. So again, thanks so much for your time. And I look forward to getting this out there and getting this in front of our audience. Oh, and thank you. And thank you to your audience. At least those who are still with us. I've enjoyed this very much. And I hope uh, people got something out of it. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for making it to the end of this interview with Dr. Rubin today. I hope you found that helpful. It answered a lot of questions for me and helps me feel better about making recommendations for these devices to my patients and to our followers on YouTube, Instagram, and elsewhere. If you want to have the ability to join our community and ask us questions, go to drdouglucas.com or look for the description in the link below to what our new program is called the HealthSpan Nation. 
Healthspan Nation is where we bring together people that are interested in improving their bone health as well as their health span. Um, and we do weekly uh, topic driven Q&A. We have a community where people can ask each other questions and talk about wins, losses, and successes. We also have a repository for all of our affiliate uh, deals and provide a lot of value for discount codes to uh, services and uh, products that we have vetted and put them all into the Healthspan Nation website and network. So come check that out. It's a, a low cost uh, monthly membership. So come check that out and we'll see you there and I'll see you on the next video. Disclaimer, this presentation is for general informational purposes only, does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this presentation are at the user's own risk. The content in this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. See you next time.